came back to, to you and Murray and uh, in the 80s, the time came for you to make a choice. Your putting wasn't up to scratch. You weren't able to compete at the level you wanted to on the European Tour and you just you needed to make a decision on you know, where you were going to go. How, how did you come to make those decisions? I, I knew I was no longer going to win. I was playing to, to make the cut, playing to make a check. And as a professional golfer, if you've played to a reasonable level, that's not acceptable. You really need to be standing on the first tee on, on Thursday thinking, if I play really well and things go OK, you know, I will have a chance on, on Sunday. Uh, that had passed me by. I knew that was finished. I remember winning in Zambia and I, I'd hit 67 greens out of 72 and just scraped home against uh, Barnes. Barnes was, was second. In Nigeria, when I won, it was on Browns. Now, you know, sand and oil, if you went out last, the hole used to get bigger <laughs> because it used to fall in. And it was always my goal at the weekend to be in the last two or three groups because the bigger the hole, the more chance I had. Yes. And, and obviously on the last two rounds there, um, the hole was, was an awful lot bigger than it was at the start of play. And that's probably the main reason I won. But Worsley was second in that one. He birdied, I think, nine of the last ten holes in, in Ekoi. Um, but I, I knew even after winning these and being confident, the confidence you get with a victory, I knew that uh, the career was, was going to be short-lived and, and you had to look at doing something else. And in these days, it was a club professional and that, that was virtually the only choices you had because golf had been my life. I hadn't done anything else. And how did TV suddenly get by, onto the map? By accident, by total accident. I, I was in the West Hiltington Golf Club that had just been opened by Dennis Thatcher. And Brian Barnes was the owner and the professional. And Barnsley was having a, a little tribuli in the, <laughs> in the bar. I don't know what number of tribuli it was, but the phone rang in the shop and I picked up the phone and, and I recognised whose voice it was. It was a chap called Andrew Miller, who was the executive director of the Emirates Club. And I said, no, Brian's not available at the minute. Um, can I give him a message? And he said, well, we're looking for someone to do the, the commentary for the Dubai Desert Classic. This was uh, 1990. And I said, well, I'll do it, just like that. And he said, fine, we'll give you 500 pounds, we'll send you an air ticket, and you come out and do it. And uh, I went out. Uh, Arabic team, who had never covered golf before, um, great people. By the end of the, the week, you think they'd covered golf for the whole of their life. And I quite enjoyed it. I was on my own for, for six hours. And I thought, well, this is just the way it is. And there was Arabic talking in your earpiece, and turned that down a little and carried on and, and came up and I quite enjoyed it. And the next day I had a call from a chap called John Colleen, producer at uh, Eurosport, uh, who became a, a great friend and a mentor. He became my mentor. And he said, would you come down and do next week the, the Spanish Open at Las Brisas? So uh, I, I went down and did that and, and that was the start of it. There was a few ups and downs uh, ahead in the next two years, but that's how I got into television. So there was no Sky at that time? Eurosport was Sky's sports station. Okay. So the, on the Sky platform, Eurosport was the, the sport. And uh, they had Sky News that had just started. And Sky was very much in its infancy then. The trouble with Eurosport is uh, Rupert Murdoch, when he had one or two problems, financial problems, when Sky was costing a lot of money at the beginning to get it up and running. He sold Eurosport to TF1 in France and, and my next year of commentary was to go over every weekend to France, which I hated with a passion. All off tape, you know, the tournaments had already been played. Uh, I didn't enjoy that at all. Were you, I mean, it must have been going through your mind at the time, um, the opportunity perhaps of joining BBC because they were still very strong in golf. They were covering the bigger tournaments in Britain, uh, not so much on the continent, but in Britain. Uh, did, did they ever approach you? No, I approached them. I approached John Shrewsbury, who was the executive producer of the BBC's golf for many years. And, and the BBC's quality of golf was, was outstanding then. And there was no vacancies. 
Um, I did work for a company, a European sports network company with Alex Hay for a year, which was a very enjoyable year. But we did all the tournaments in Carnaby Street uh, in London. We didn't go to any tournaments. <laughs> we said goodbye from Germany at five o'clock and hello from Florida at half past six, you know, <laughs> and, and off we went. Uh, that was real fun. That, that was great fun. And in the early part of, of any career, you have a tremendous amount of energy. I mean, I wouldn't like to have to go back to that now, but, but it's the way it was then. And that company uh, then went bankrupt and was bought by Eurosport. So the next move would have been back to Paris. And I, I thought, well, that's the end of that. And two weeks later, Sky Sports started their own channel. I mean... Lucky they, break. Well, they took right place, right time. Yeah. Had that not happened, I don't know what would have happened. I, I may have been teaching at a driving range. I, I may have been a club professional somewhere. I may have been a greenkeeper. I don't know. But, but there was no future after after screen sport um, finished. It's probably fair to say that your voice is on television in talking about golf more than anybody in the world. I hadn't thought of that. Shame for everyone else to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I suppose so. I mean, the tournaments we cover with, with Sky, we have, we have over 100 tournaments a year on, on Sky Sports alone, of which I do probably 33, 34. Um, so yes, and, and we're on air for a long time. Um, the BBC days, they used to come on for an hour and a half, and, and that was their broadcast for the day. You know, an hour and a half is like a rehearsal for us nowadays. I mean, we're on air 10 hours, so that's how things have evolved in the last quarter of a century. Now, over this period of time, obviously you're on television, uh, you, you're better known than many of the players out there. You must have had a lot of opportunities to get involved in other things, golf course design being just one of them, and, and endorsing different things. But you've managed to stay away from that. I, I look at, at my job as one that needs 100% concentration, research, because we don't cover one tour. We cover the European tour, we cover the PGA tour, the ladies tour, we cover the challenge tour, the web.com tour. Not every week, but you have to know what's going on. So. It is a full-time job. I have stayed away from the um, commercial side of things. Course design I've done a, a little bit of. I thoroughly enjoyed that uh, in the early days there. Goodwood I was involved in with Howard Swan, uh, an old James Braid course that we put back together for the Duke of Richmond. Uh, that was good fun, but in general, I have a, I have a full-time job. I, I have weeks at home, but they're not weeks off. Uh, you're always looking forward to the next tournament to see what's going to happen there, to see what the field is. Maybe it's a new venue, so you need to find out about the venue. And, and that, it's enough for me, and I enjoy it. The difference in style between what Sky does and what they do in America? Well, Sky's coverage uh, editorially is, I think, excellent. Uh, the way American TV is, is what Americans are used to and what we cannot get used to. Two shots, commercial break, one shot, commercial break, putt, commercial break. It's just the way they've been brought up. It's the way television is in the United States. So it's very difficult to cover a proper story on the PGA Tour because of the interruptions. Uh, we don't have so much of that. Sky is a commercial channel, but th three breaks in 60 minutes. So you're going to lose uh, seven and a half minutes out of 60. You can still be able to develop a story with that. So I think Sky's coverage has been innovative. I think they've moved along nicely. They've gone through the change from analog to digital uh, and the enormous costs that uh, that incurred just after the turn of the century. So the first 20 odd years, uh, they had ups and downs, but the future looks great for them. I'm going to be very unfair now. and I'm going to ask you your opinion on some of your fellow commentators. <laughs> but let's let's start with the the doyen, Peter Ellis. Peter I don't see as a commentator. I see Peter as a, a raconteur, a, a chap that takes you down a quiet country lane and he's never quite sure whether to turn left or turn right or, or should I just carry on for a little while longer and then maybe come back again. If you ask people down the years, well, who's the person who's given them the most enjoyment? Peter will always be top of that list. He's lovely to listen to. He rambles along. He has a look at things on the screen and he starts getting into a story about that. 
But you have to remember when he started, there was four cameras and it wasn't unusual to be on the same picture for two minutes. So it allowed that style of what we know as commentary today. Longhurst was exactly the same. Peter and Longhurst were, were almost identical and, and tremendously professional at what they did. But in these two minutes nowadays, you could have nine shots. So you can't follow that style. And the first thing that was drummed into me as a commentator was never, ever copy anyone. Use your own style, and if you're not good enough, you'll be out of a job in, in two or three months anyway. Which is exactly what you've done. Yeah, don't copy. Um, but I came into television when all these new things were happening, and we no longer had one picture lasting two, two and a half minutes. It's all quick now. You go over to 14, you go back to five, you've got two T starts. You know, the job before you go on air is, is as important as the job on air. And you need to know where everyone is because with television cameras now, 18, 20 cameras, they have the ability to go straight to the first tee and then go to the 17th green. So they didn't have that in, in Peter's day. So I don't see him as a modern television commentary, but I, I see him as a wonderful storyteller and, uh, and a chap that gave so much joy to so many.